But friends, this morning, we get to lean into not just our last message in this series that we've been in for the last several weeks, as we kind of are on the edge of now, then the Thanksgiving and Christmas season, right? Christmas is, is coming here soon, right? Woo! Right, even, uh, even yesterday, or I think it was Friday, yesterday or Friday, um, Mason jumped on my computer and, and Aaron asked him, what are you doing, Mason? What are you doing? And, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm ordering presents for the mailman to bring me. <laughs> oh my goodness. But, uh, but listen, but in this series, we've been walking through the book of Acts. And this has been a great conversation, one that we've been having on Sunday morning and one that we've been really leaning into throughout the week in our small groups. But listen, this morning there comes a moment. Last week we talked about the moment where, where this guy named Saul meets Jesus, a powerful moment where his life is completely spun around and how he becomes a person who was once against what God is trying to do and against, uh, against this new work of, of, of what God is bringing into the world, and now he is for it and being used for it. Incredible. And you see, after that moment, there's great peace that happens in the life of the church, but it doesn't last for long because someone else steps up to the plate, and this person, too, has his, his sight set on taking down the church. And you see, what happens, this guy named Herod becomes king of all Judea area in this, this section of the world, of, under the provision of, of the Roman Empire, and you see, you've, you've heard of this guy a little bit, but you have actually heard and read about his father and his grandfather. You see, Herod's grandfather was the one we read about in Matthew chapter 2, the moment where he's trying to use the Magi to find who the Messiah is that people are saying are born in the world because he wants to go and get him and, and, and take him out. We've read about his father because he's the same gentleman who's Herod the Tetrarch who killed John the Baptist. And so they're really focused at keeping it in the family when it comes to being against what God is trying to do. And you see what happens is Herod becomes king, Herod Agrippa I. He becomes king over this area. And what happens is he actually captures one of the apostles of the church, one of the original 12 disciples who then Jesus sends as, like, as the leaders of the church and they kind of get their name kind of changed a little bit into these apostles, these apostolic leaders of this new movement in the book of Acts. And what happens is Herod finds James and he kills him. James is the, is the brother of John, the same John that we read uh, his gospel that he wrote, the same, the same John that wrote the three letters that come a little bit later in the New Testament, the same John that wrote the book of Revelation. And James is the very first of one of the original 12 leaders of the church, or really the original 11, I should say, that are killed, that are martyred. And I, I wonder, even for myself, I, I wonder if, Seeing his brother give his life for the cause of Christ is what built such a fire for God inside of John that used him to later on in his life um, write all these books for all the church and his love for the church because he saw how his brother laid his life down for the church. And you see what happens is it shakes the church, as you would imagine, because this has never happened before. And you see what happens is that Herod actually captures Peter as well. And as you would imagine, people are freaking out because they knew what just happened to James, what is now going to happen to Peter. And you see, God did something great in this moment because what happens is as Peter is stored away in prison, and we'll read about this in our groups, but, but what kind of happens, my imagination gets a little bit crazy. So come on, give me some grace with this one. I imagine what happens is Peter's in prison and then God sends an angel to bust him out, right? And I just picture him coming in, busting him out, right? And it says, Come with me if you want to live, right? Maybe that doesn't happen in, in the story, but right, he, he rescues him out of prison and takes him out, right? And it's an incredible story. Listen, I encourage y'all, listen, read it, Acts 12. We'll read it in our groups this week. But listen, look forward to it because it's a powerful moment of God showing up when all hope had gone, when people were sure hope had gone. Because when, when Peter comes and finds the gathering of believers that he was with before he was taken, they're like, they hear this knocking at the door, and, and they don't think it's Peter. They've been praying for God to help him, but all of a sudden, God answers their prayers, and, and they didn't even believe it. They didn't believe it. All hope had gone, but God still stepped in. And you see what happens is Herod is infuriated by this. He's angry. He's uh, filled with vengeance, and he, 
He interrogates all the guards who are on duty and he executes them all. And after all this dust begins to settle, Herod says, listen, I'm, I'm taking off for a little while. And he actually packs up his bags, he gets together some belongings, he takes some men with him, and he heads to the coastline further north of the city of Jerusalem. And what happens is as he's in that city, something, again, God moves in a way that's quite, quite bewildering. It's in Acts chapter 12, verses 19, the second half of 19, that we'll begin our reading this morning. But listen to what this says. We'll read a few verses at a time and talk our way through it. It says first, it says, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea, and he stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and, and they now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food. And what's happening in this moment is that Herod is, is using and leveraging his power against these people. He holds all of the balls in his court. He, he has all every bit of save how much food gets to these, these cities and these villages. And, and he is leveraging and he's taking advantage of these people. And they, they even go as far to try to find someone who's on, on, on Herod's good side to speak on their behalf in their favor. I mean, they're begging for his help. And this is what happens next. It says, On the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne delivering, it delivered a public address to the people, and they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And, and historians actually tell us, because this is a, you know, Herod is, it, w w what's amazing with the Bible is that this is not just like history in a jar that sits on the shelf separate from the rest of world history. This, this is world history. And so there are many other historical documents that tell us about this day because he was qu quite a well-known official in the kingdom and and what they tell us about the day is that there he was in his throne room with hundreds of people in the room and he's wearing these garments with metallic elements built into him woven in pieces of silver and whatnot and what would happen is when the sun would hit him it would beam into the eyes of the congregation or into the eyes of of, of, of the audience in front of him i mean it, he would radiate and that was the intentional aspect of what he's wearing is that when he would stand or sit in the sunlight, it would tinkle and it would it would it would uh, it would glisten in the light, and it was it was blinding to folks at times, as almost this sense of divine radiance would come off of him, and that's what he was out to accomplish in that moment. But then God shows up. Read verse twenty-three with me. It says immediately. Because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And listen to this, he was eaten by worms and died. He was eaten by worms and died. Isn't that crazy? Let's read it again. He was eaten by worms and died. Oh my goodness. Again, all the supporting documents that kind of talk about this moment in history explain that Herod collapsed instantly. He collapsed instantly from some sort of overwhelming pain in his body. He was taken away, and what it was described at that time was he felt like he was dying from the inside out. He was dying from the inside out, and he, he lived for a couple more days, and then he died. And it's, it's insane. I mean, he, he was killed from the inside out. What an, ex, what's an, what an excruciating, what a painful way to go out in the world. And that is what happens to him. How crazy is that? Then it says in verse 24, where the word of God continued to spread and flourish. And what's so wonderful about how that is written is the word but means in spite of. And is kind of a continuation of, therefore, is usually like a conclusion point, all these things add together, so this means that. But means Herod has tried his absolute best. He tried his absolute best with James, he tried his absolute best with Peter, and many other Christians, and he tried his absolute best to put a stop to what God was doing. But he failed. But he failed. And you see, in this moment, we read about a man who did some horrible things, evil things, 
And it's easy for us to, to move on to the next moment in Scripture and just say, okay, what, what kind of happens next? It's easy for us to overlook what happens in this moment. But I do not want us to miss the reason why. The reason why Herod dies. Because it was said in this moment. It said in verse 23, it said, because Herod did not give praise to God. I, I love how the New King James also says it. It says, because Herod did not give glory to to God. He was an evil man who guilty of martyring people, taking, taking advantage of cities, being a dictator in the way that he would manipulate com communities and, and withhold their food and leverage his power. This egotistical driven gentleman. This man who, who had a, a God complex, right, when he would put on his special robes and stand before audiences. He would do all these Horrible, horrible things. But yet, it doesn't say that he was struck down for any of those other things. It just says this. Because he did not give glory to God. Wow. We may not have friends the same track record of a past. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. We may not have the same track record of the past of, of horrible deeds, of hurting people and doing all these things, but what is, what is mind-blowing is that we could very easily have the same posture of a heart towards God as Herod. Because he was guilty of something so, so seemingly small and so seemingly innocent, but yet... Yet it was the thing that drove the nail in the coffin for him and what slammed the door on his heart. Saw a man before him. In chapter 9, we read about a man who killed lots of Christians, did some wrong things with good intentions, but yet still, still met God and was transformed by God. And here's another man doing some pretty terrible things. And yet the condition of his heart, his unwillingness to give glory and praise to God was what led him down the road with the destination of where he ended. And it's vital we grab a hold of this, friends, because something like this is something that can easily go unnoticed, something that can very easily be unchecked within our life. Because understand what is happening is that he's exuding this sense of pride. And we have to understand that pride isn't always this external, arrogant sense of living. It is this unwillingness to understand who God is and who we are. It is an unwillingness to recognize that, that we are the child in the relationship and, and he is, he's the, the father. Just as in a household, Kids would understand that they're the kids, right? Even though they test their boundaries, right? They still listen and respect mom and dad. They, they listen to the instructions. They listen to the order. At least, you know, sometimes, right? Maybe they reach certain seasons of life where it's a little more difficult, but that's okay. But, but we understand the dynamic in the same way. Our hearts fall into this trap. Because all of what it means to give God glory is to give Him the respect, the love, the admiration, the thankfulness that He deserves. That's all, that's all it means. It's not, something, it's not something insane or complex. It's just understanding that, that He is creator. I'm, I'm the created. He is perfect. I'm not. He is, he is all love. And I'm selfish. That's what it means to understand who we are in this, in this relationship. And it's vital we begin to grasp this because it can so easily go unchecked in our walk with God. Jesus himself comes across a young man, a young man who had a lot of possessions in his life. And, and what happens, the young man comes to him and says, listen, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to be right with God? He says, what must I do to in, you know, inherit eternal life? But what must I do to be right with God? And, and, and then he goes on to say, you know, I follow all the commandments. I've done all the right things. I've, done, I've helped people. I've been generous. I've given the poor. I've served. I've, I, I've volunteered. I've, I've, get, I, I've been a nice person. I held open the door. 
right? I, I help the old people cross the street. I, I'm a nice person. And then Jesus looks at him. He says, I want you to go give away everything you have. And the guy says, I can't do that. Now that there's something evil about having a lot of wealth. Now that there's evil about being successful in life. But Jesus saw right through all the smoke and he saw the reality of this man's condition. He saw that he valued all of what he had. He valued his image. He valued his comfort. He valued the respect he got from his community. He valued how people saw him and saw him and looked up to him. He valued so many other things more than God. And that is the dynamic of what it means to give God glory is what do we value? What do we value? Many times throughout the Gospels, Jesus reiterates a teaching from the Old Testament. It, he reiterates it in this moment, Matthew 22. He says, he says love the Lord with, with what? Say it. All your heart. And, and with what? All your soul. And, and with what? All your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus reminds his disciples, he reminds people, he reminds the Pharisees, he reminds everybody all the time. Hey, listen, have you forgotten what it says in Deuteronomy? Have you forgotten the summary of the law? Have you forgotten? This is it. This is it. We sometimes get overwhelmed with the complexity of all these testaments and these, or the, I'm sorry, the, 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 the commandments and all these other guidelines and all these other parts of the Old Testament. But listen, don't you, don't you just remember? Don't you just remember how simple it all is? But I want to ask two questions this morning, church. And, and if we can be honest with ourselves, these questions are simple and they can be asked to a child. But they are ones that reveal a lot to us. And they are ones that begin to even reveal to us what God sees when he sees this. This first question is, is there anything God could give you to make you love him more. The second question is this. Is there anything God could take away that would make you love him less? You see, what is important about these two questions is they reveal something very important to us. They reveal he was at the center of the relationship. They reveal who exists for who. Because if we existed to give God all of our life and all of our glory, if we existed just to worship him and be, be his servants, be his children, love him with every bit of our heart and expect nothing in return, then our answer would be no. But if we can be transparent for a moment, there's still a part of us that thinks instantly of an answer, even though in the back of our mind we think, no, 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 push that aside. Because there's a part of our flesh that very much comes alive that seeks out after our best interest. And we say, you know, Lord, I'll, I'll love you with all of my heart. All, 100%. If you were to do such. If you were finally to fix this person that I'm just having so much difficulty with. If you were finally to provide this for me. I've been praying for so long. Lord, I, I would love you more if, if you finally, finally showed up the way I'm asking you to. I would love you more if finally you, you, you changed what I've, been, what I've been struggling with for so, so long. The reality of the second question is, is that, Lord, if you were to take this away, or if you were to never do this, I'd have a hard time loving you with all of my heart. I could get to maybe 70%. I could get to maybe 50%. I'll never, I'll never walk away. I'll never denounce. But I'll have a hard time getting to 100 if this is never done. You see, there's a well-known story, and perhaps you know it. You know it for one part of the story, but there's a whole other ending that maybe you've never heard. You see, a long, long time ago, there was a gentleman named Horatio who was a very successful businessman. And when he was 33, he married the love of his life, Anna. And it was just stars in the sky. 
They had kids together. They had five children together. Life was going well and everything was going great and, and, and they were very devout in their faith. They walked with Jesus faithfully. They, they served in their church. They were leaders in their church. They were even great friends with, 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 with Dr. Moody, this gentleman who was a great evangelist and pastor in the 1800s here in America. And they were people that everyone looked up to for their great faith and devotion to God. We see what happened is that one day everything began to change. And maybe you know how the story goes. You see, what happens is that one day their four-year-old son, their only son, Horatio Jr., gets sick and dies. Such a great tragedy for any family to experience. For any parent to experience. But it was just the beginning of their story. Because after a few more years, what happened is a great fire would take out in their city and it would actually destroy much of their wealth and much of their property that they had. And so all of, all of what they'd been successful at building was then turned to ash overnight, losing everything. A few years later, what would happen is that Anna would take their four girls, 11, 9, 5, and 2, and jump on a ship to head over to England to celebrate uh, a holiday together, go on vacation uh, together. And what would happen is that on their way, they collided with another ship at 2 o'clock in the morning. And in Anna's biography, it shares the story that she remembers holding her four girls. And she remembers the water coming up to their feet, then to their ankles, to their knees. And then she remembers a loud crash. And she remembers what it felt as the four girls were ripped from her arms. Never be seen again. She survived along with a handful of other people from the ship and she sent word back to her husband back in, back in the States about what had happened and he begins to make his way over to meet them. And perhaps you know what comes next in the story as he is traveling across the water. He comes to the spot in the ocean where that same wreckage had taken place where his four daughters had all died. And as gazing across the water, looking at the, the tragedy, just imagining what would have taken place. He, he pulls out his pen in his journal. He begins to, he begins to write this, the, some of the most famous lines in all of, uh, of hymnal history. He writes, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. You see, what happens next is Horatio meets up with his wife Anna. And after a few years, they have a few more children and they lose another one, tragically. But what happens is Anna herself, <laughs> one Sunday morning, is reminded as she's in church and they're in worship, and as the pra pastor preaches that Sunday, they're reminded of how all of our life belongs to God. All of our life belongs to Him. And that let no day go to waste. And even though they had suffered greatly, Anna and her husband packed up their belongings and they moved to the Middle East, to Israel, to Jerusalem, where they lived as missionaries for the rest of their life, leading people to Jesus. They had suffered so much. But yet, said, Lord, we belong to you. All of our life is yours. And so we'll live every day until we are in the ground for you. Because we loved you when we had everything. We loved you when we had nothing. And we will still continue to tell everybody that you're the king of the world. And you see, what is vital for us to begin to understand, friends, is that when we embody this type of desire to love God in this way. It's this, it's this obsession with making sure that he has our all. That we belong to him. That we are not our own. That he is not just the center of our life that leads and speaks truth and guides everything, but yet we belong to him. Everything we have belongs to him. Every bit of who we are 
belongs to him. He, he sustains us. He leads us because we belong to him. Because we belong to him. I, I want us to understand a few more things. This real that, that a heart that is full of life is one that is fully sacrificed for the glory of God. Making sure that in everything we do, in the way that we live our life, in the way that we lead our homes and lead our households, that it would bring glory to God. The way we honor our wives and we raise our children and encourage those around us, that it would bring glory to God. The way that we work in our jobs, even if we really don't enjoy it, but we would walk in, we'd be reliable, we'd be dependable, we'd be trustworthy. All of these things, whether we're the employer or the employee, whether we're the boss or we're the person following the leader, listen, that we would, we would serve and work hard to bring glory to God. Not just a nine to five to earn a paycheck, but that we would bring glory to God in all that we do. And the way that we're around people and the way that we would tell people about our faith. That we would make sure that, that our life is one not full of hypocrisy, but one that is obedient to God and wanting to be changed. Wanting to be changed. It's okay if we got a long way to go. But it's about wanting to keep moving forward. And saying, Lord, I want to bring you glory. I want my grandkids to tell stories about me and my faith and my love for you and my generosity and my obedience. I, I want family stories to be told when I am gone about how grandpa or how grandma or how great grandma or me, me and papa, whoever, how, how they just, they love Jesus. And they were, they, they lived for him only this time I, I, I saw them make a, a massive donation to help somebody. I, I, saw, I saw Grandpa get out of his truck to help somebody who broke down on the side of the road. I saw my dad, I, I saw him go and give hand to someone who was in need even though he was so overwhelmed. I saw how he gave glory to God in, in everything. A heart that is full of life. What we want to know, what we want to live, what we want to experience, what we're chasing after, trying to find. A heart that is full of life is one that is fully sacrificed for the glory of God. And that is it. That is it. Because life is but a, a vapor, the Bible says. It is quick, it is short. It is why Solomon writes so much in Ecclesiastes about how it is better to go to a funeral than to a wedding. Because <laughs> it reminds us of the value of life in each day and the way that we live it. I want us to understand that a heart full of life is one full of love for God with no strings attached. Sometimes it's hard to journey through life. Things come our way that are just not fun. You all know what I mean? <laughs> we say, Lord, I still belong to you fully. Regardless. I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe in faith that you're going to heal. I'm going to believe in faith that you're going to provide. I know you can. I know you might. I know you will. I know you'll take care of this. I know you do that. Lord, I'm going to call out to you for this. Lord, you still have my all. Whether you do or don't. When you read the story of Peter in prison, you know what you don't read? You don't hear him say, Lord, don't you see my faithfulness to you? Lord, don't you see how I've stepped on a limb I've been obedient to you for so long. Why don't, you, why don't you get me out of this place? We don't see Peter say that. We don't see him. In Scripture, he doesn't say anything. There's no recording of what he might be praying or speaking, but I would imagine he would say, Lord, 
It's not about me. It's about you. I'm just a pawn. I belong to you. I've lived the greatest life I could possibly live, even if it ends now, because I've loved you with every bit of who I am. Listen, I encourage you, chase after Jesus. Want to be close to him. The other day, I was, it was early in the morning, I was getting ready, I was brushing my teeth, it was about 4 o'clock, and <laughs> Mason walked into the bathroom. What, what are you doing up? It's 4 o'clock in the morning, go back to bed. He says, Daddy, I just wanted to be with you. All right, I don't need to go to work today. Let's go. Let's just let's just hang out today. Jesus, I just want to be with you. If it means if I wake up early in the morning, I want to be. I just want to be with you. If it means I bring my Bible into the into my job and my lunch break, I just sit there and read. Yeah, I've done that. Listen, I remember when I was in college working at Lowe's, and every day I'd sit there in my lunch break, and I'd just sit and read and talk to people. And I tell you what, I got some looks, and that's okay. But I also had people who knew who to turn to when they were struggling. And I may not have had buddy-buddy friendships with everybody, but I had lots of times of praying for people because they knew. They knew who to go to. Let Jesus be the center. Just want him. And say, Lord, hide me behind your cross whether it's through my pain that you bring glory to yourself or it's through my success bring glory to you, Lord, I am nothing. Even the good life I've had already, I've had because of you, not because of me. If we begin to live this way, friends, I tell you what, we'd experience a reviving work of the Holy Spirit in our life that we have never, never known. I promise you that in your life, in your children's life, in your spouse's life, in your family's life, in your household, in your neighborhood, in your family tree, in your workplace, you'd experience the outpour of the Holy Spirit in your life that you have never seen before because you have never let him before use you like this, fill you like this, lay yourself down like this for him. And I promise if you did, you would not regret it. You wouldn't. Would you pray with me?